Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, depends on where you are. It's our great pleasure to have Professor Yiglof Pofflos here to give a lecture. I'm Zheng Chen from Peking University in China. Please allow me to briefly introduce Professor Yiglof Pofflos. Professor Yiglof Pofflos is a William Leonard Professor of Engineering in the Department of, of Aerospace and the Mechanical Engineering at the University of South California. He obtained his diploma degree from National Technical University of Athens and uh, his PhD degree from the University of California at Davis after having spent the last two years of his doctoral research at the Princeton University. He is a recipient of the Silver Medal of the Combustion Institute at the 22nd International Combustion Symposium. He has authored and co-authored 147 general publications and has given 162 invited lectures. Uh, he is a fellow of the Commercial Institute, a fellow of the ASME, and an associate fellow of the ARWA. Since 2009, he is the editor-in-chief of the Combustion Frame. So now, uh, Falkin, the podium is yours. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers of the webinar for inviting me. It's a great honor to to be giving those lectures along with other distinguished colleagues. Um, I, the way I, com I composed this, uh, this uh, presentation uh, was to basically address not only the senior colleagues, but also the junior colleagues, and more important, the students. I'm not sure how many students attend this, but uh, I have some introductory comments that are maybe trivial to some of you, but maybe to put things in context, I felt, especially for the younger people, they're important. I changed here the title to fundamental because combustion research, um, it can be viewed as in different ways. But anyway, what I meant is a combustion research that our institute does, the Combustion Institute, and uh, I call it fundamental. Um, and, and one thing that started uh, occurring to me the last, uh, I guess, 20 years, although I have intensified my efforts the last 10 years, is how can I get closer to whatever happens in application? So um, we know that we, it's clear that the uh, combustion process has been dominating the energy conversion sector and because the, the violent process, the high energy density, all driven by the second law of thermodynamics. And of course, relatively speaking, combustors are inexpensive. Um, of course, the climate change is a big deal. Uh, the emissions are, uh, uh, are, are, are significant. And of course, now we have evidence that CO2 contributes to the global warming, so we have a big issue, a big problem in our hands. And we understand that uh, there is a, 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 a worldwide, there's an effort by governments to achieve zero carbon emissions within 20, 30 years. And some of us on this, uh, on this presentation, uh, of the attendees today uh, have been, uh, uh, we had exchanges the last few weeks regarding this issue, whether mm -hmm. a zero carbon can be achieved or not. Um, so, uh, of course, we know what happens politically and also scientifically. Uh, not everybody agrees about this approach. Um, and and uh, uh, as Yiguan mentioned during those exchanges, and I agree, and most of us most likely should agree, is that the solution finally would be found somewhere in between. My opinion is reduced carbon would be uh, the, uh, what's going to happen at the end, but again, this remains to be seen. Um, so, uh, if we, uh, regardless how well we can predict the future, um, it, it is very safe to assume that the combustion process would be relevant, okay? And again, I share some of the, um, uh, my own points and also points made by my colleagues the last few weeks based on exchange. For example, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid cars uh, are expected to be relevant and combustion will be there. Hydrogen natural gas economies, uh, we believe that combustion will be part of it. Um, air propulsion, it doesn't seem that anything will replace right now the, the jet engines. Uh, of course, space propulsion, uh, defense applications require high energy density. Uh, material synthesis, including nanoparticles, again, combustion can be very relevant. And of course, natural phenomena, uh, uh, by default, combustion is, is, is the main issue there and anything else you can imagine. So would we'll be around, the combustion field would be around. Um, in this presentation, I don't want to elaborate on those details, but instead uh, to address some questions regarding fundamental combustion research. The question that I raise is, is existing understanding sufficient to guide engine design and operation 
so that we can improve uh, efficiencies and reduce emissions, right? Uh, if this is sufficient, then we have to ask why, but if it's not, then um, how do we expect to attract interest from funding agencies, the most important uh, industry? And what, uh, how, what do we do to close this gap? Um, again, the combustion sciences we know today, you can start from Semenov about 100 years ago, Bunsen was trying to measure flame speeds 150 years ago, I mean, it's 100 to 150 years, I guess, uh, has been around. And in a way, we are labeled as a mature science. Um, when somebody names a, a science mature or a discipline mature, then the bar is really high. So then they ask you the difficult questions. Can you predict? Uh, can you predict something for me and not give me a hand-waving answer? Um, and of course, the younger is an is, is a area like materials, nano, bio, the bar is lower, but for us, the bar is very high. Um, it is very, as most of you know, uh, dealing with combustion is a very, very difficult, uh, uh, it's very difficult to deal with the combustion problems. Uh, major experimental challenges, uh, for example, uh, limitations in diagnostics, uh, uh, more important resolutions in space and time. It's a multi-scale process. How do you do you resolve all this uh, uh, these scales? Uh, and again, the large. It's a very violent process, and being violent, of course, is positive in terms of have high energy density at the same time. Um, this this really affects the uh, the way we do experiments because there are safety and other issues that we need to consider. Um, instabilities is another problem uh, that uh, always is there, and uh, safety, as I said. Now, theoretically, uh, there are similar issues and a few different. Um, of course, resolving things in space and time, modeling, for example, is not trivial. Um, the, the various dependent variables, the various uh, dependent variables are uh, strongly coupled. Uh, there are st strong nonlinear terms. And uh, there are serious uncertainties associated with turbulence chemistry and molecular transport, which is typically not considered seriously by our community. And I'm not even touching here or multi-phase flows. <laughs> I'm only discussing gaseous fuel because I'm more familiar with it at the same time. It's, it's th in theory, it's an easier problem to tackle as opposed to sprays and phase change and, and uh, much more complex phenomena. Um, at the same time, we, regardless of all these challenges, it, it's really remarkable what has been done of, since the mid-50s uh, uh, with theory first and then development of diagnostics and, and algorithms and, and computer capabilities. We really have, have, have done unbelievable things and now we can, we're, we're in a good position to predict even combustion properties under certain conditions. Now, um, if you consider combustion sizes a chair, there are four, there are four uh, legs here, thermodynamics, kinetics, molecular transport, the fluid mechanics. And in terms of scales, so you have to consider all of the above. But in terms of scale, this is uh, a plot created by the EFRC team led by Professor Law. Uh, by, uh, 10 years ago, we started this effort. And here you can see basically the, the length scales and the and the, and the time scales, and you, go, and you see we're going from the pico level quantum mechanics all the way to, to millimeter, we're getting into uh, the real applications. And uh, um, you see here the different, the different um, areas of research, and of course, where is the interface between uh, chemistry and fluid, as we say, continuum interface at the micrometer level. So we have a, a truly multi-scale problem to, to address here. Um, parameter space, just to put into perspective, stationary uh, gas turbines, again, uh, if, you, if I'm missing something here, I apologize. Um, stationary gas turbines can go from 1 to 20 atmospheres, and different fuels can be used from gas to even diesel. Um, gas turbines for jet propulsion, now they're going up to 30 atmospheres, but the new generation may go up to 60 atmospheres. Typically, fuel is kerosene between 11 and 12 carbon number. Um, spike ignition engines, uh, Rolf, of course, can correct me. Um, I would guess between 25 and 80 atmospheres is relevant, and you can, we can burn natural gas uh, or gasoline type fuels between with carbon between 5 and 8. 
Um, compression ignition engines can go up to 100 atmospheres. Um, there are discussions to go up to 300 atmospheres, right? Uh, for future uh, generation of uh, diesel engines. And again, natural gas and diesel type fuels are relevant with, which of course are heavier compared to gasoline and kerosene. Uh, in terms of rockets, uh, I have a video here, uh, Falcon 9. Um, this is a, a no man's land. Uh, the pressures are, the, the thermodynamic conditions are really uh, excessive, uh, above 100 atmospheres, and uh, um, I don't think we have any information regarding this, this range of conditions. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have the scramjet. Uh, here, the operation pressure can be between, let's say, 0.5 and 3 atmospheres. Fuels can be uh, hydrogen, or now they consider endothermic liquid fuels. You see on the right uh, animation by Prater Whitney, the, the scramjet takes off at high altitude, uh, propelled by a rocket, and eventually uh, you will see that uh, after a while the rocket will be detached and the scramjet. Now you will see the detachment, and then the rocket will be, and now you see the scramjet operation, right? So um, again, I'm trying to address uh, the entire spectrum of, of the attendees. Um, the way, uh, uh, this is kind of a very rough uh, approximation of how we do this. Uh, first, we, we deal with chemistry in homogeneous reactors. We're trying to understand, we carry experiments there, trying to avoid complications from transport. And that's basically how we compile kinetic models. Um, step two is to investigate fundamental combustion properties in, in laminar flames, which of course have to be low dimensional, preferably one dimensional. So uh, going from one to two dimensions in combustion is, is, a, is a major undertaking. And they certainly go up. We have to account for transport. Um, and formulate a database for testing models. I, I try to remove from my vocabulary the test validation because when you say validation, it's a loaded word. I prefer to say testing. Um, and of course, the laminar flames can, will not tell you what the chemistry is, but will tell you uh, where the problem are, problems are, right? They reveal weaknesses both in kinetic and transport models. Um, then, uh, the laminar flames is a necessary but not sufficient link between chemistry and turbulent flames, which of course is the, the next step, and it is the ultimate goal of combustion science. At the end of the day, we want to know what happens in an engine, right, which means turbulent flames. Um, so we need to adapt knowledge from step one and step two. And of course, then we have to introduce uh, uh, the uh, turbulent transport uh, models. Which is, uh, which is not uh, trivial. And in addition to turbulent transport models, there are other models evolved. And on top of that, you have to also um, consider the coupling between models, which is very interesting. Um, also, um, the, 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 now uh, our community is really paying a lot of attention on how the turbulence evolves through reacting layers. And reading more and more about uh, from leading researchers how they do this, I'm, I'm really confused. I think the ambiguities are, are, are significant and, and a lot of contradictions exist. But this is exciting also because it means there is more to be done. Uh, moving forward, uh, what I just described is a very generic uh, uh, approach. Um, then we need to address uh, the relevance. Relevance means uh, do we solve problems of conditions that resemble or approach those we, found we have in engines, right? This means, do we, do we tackle the right fuels? Do we tackle the right pressures? Do we tackle the right temperatures? Do we tackle the right flu mechanics? Um, as I will show you later, uh, we're not there yet. At the same time, we understand that combustion can be much easier uh, uh, studied at so-called convenient conditions. And this is great because you have to walk before we run. But at this point, given the, cro the crossroads that combustion is at right now, um, this is not enough. Uh, we have an uphill, uphill battle, and we have to be, in my opinion, more relevant. Um, of course, we can blame, the, as I described earlier, experimental and modeling limitations and the all types of scales. But in my opinion, this can be only partially blamed, right? Uncertainty is something that concerns me, um, and that's maybe the motivation of not being there, 
For example, when we're dealing with convenient conditions, whatever, I mean, we know what they are, I'll show you later. Um, we're very strict. We say, okay, we're, we are applied scientists, scientists, we're engineers, whatever you want to call us. And then we say, okay, we want data within five to 10% or maximum 20%. That's fine. Uh, when you start going to conditions of relevance to engines and you try to do fundamental work, are you asking for the same, the same question, basically? Do you ask for the same level of uncertainty? More important, do we encourage efforts in that direction, okay? Under with the understanding that the uncertainty will go up uh, as you go to those extreme conditions, but also uh, we know that usually um, after the first efforts, then we become smarter and smarter and, and uncertainty can be reduced eventually. So um, regarding experiments at any relevant conditions, homogeneous kinetic experiments, um, it's no problem for people to go up to 50, 500, Ron Hanson and Ken Brzezinski, I mean, Ken has a shock tube going up to 1,000 atmospheres, I guess. So homogeneous reactors can reach those, those and, and the results are pretty, pretty reliable. So I don't see too many, I mean, there are problems, but not as much as, as uh, compared to flames, as I will discuss later. Lambda flames can, we can do, we can do experiments up to 50 to 60 atmospheres. Uh, Ed Locke has measured, uh, has done this up to 60 atmospheres. Now, turbulent flames is, uh, is very, very tricky. I started looking into that. And um, I'm not encouraged to do that, by the way, by many, but that's okay. That's a different topic of discussion. Um, if you think about the turbulent flame experiments and says, well, I want to do it um, typically steady state, uh, uh, experiments for turbulence, um, maybe you can go up to 10 atmospheres. Um, and one thing is that uh, uh, thermal management of enclosures is an issue if you want to study, for example, jet flames. Um, regarding theory of energy relevant conditions, uh, several questions. Uh, how is chemistry affected? Well, these are questions. I don't have all the answers. Are collisions so fast that we don't have rate limiting steps? Uh, do we have a reliable description of kinetic pathways or so rate constants at eight atmospheres, 80 atmospheres? Can we extrapolate from models we have at atmospheric conditions all the way to, to 50 or 100 atmospheres? Uh, transport coefficients, um, are existing theories valid even for simple molecules? More important, how about linear molecules, those long snakes? Uh, do we understand their transport, especially for heavy molecules? Uh, equation of state. Uh, at what point we, we, we have limits for the ideal gas assumption? And how do we deal with near and supercritical conditions over and beyond certain equations that exist? Do we understand this? Navier Stokes, uh, interesting. Um, of course, I teach the students and I tell them they're only valid for moderate densities. It can, is that true of those conditions if we reach 100 atmospheres or more? But more important, this is a tricky issue. Are we allowed to decouple transport the chemistry, which we do when we develop, uh, uh, when we um, derive the navier stokes equation? Those two terms are decoupled. And is that true at those conditions? All right, the self-assessment. Now, I asked my group, spent a year uh, uh, serving um, about 3,500 papers. Um, about 300 on laminar flame propagation. Um, uh, laminar flame propagation, of course, I do, you know that I, most of you know that I do this, uh, but it's, it's, it's beyond that. And I explain why I say laminar flame propagation because simply I'm addressing engine relevant, relevant condition. And then um, about 3,300 uh, papers on turbulent flames. Uh, the laminar flame papers are experimental. The 3,300 papers are experimental and theoretical slash modeling. Just to give you, uh, 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 just uh, uh, here also, since we're doing this, I, I, I did some, some survey uh, between two, nine, uh, up to uh, 2018. And I, I found out that in those major journals, um, it's, we have about 24, 25,000 papers uh, 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 published. Um, now, in terms of the details of interest to this presentation, uh, we look into uh, foundational fuels, and then we said what 
uh, how many flame speed measurements have been done for those gaseous fuels uh, above 10 atmospheres. And we roughly, we found about 10% of, of all studies for gaseous fuels are above 10 atmospheres. Then we move on to um, heavy, uh, pre-vaporized heavy meat liquid and practical jet and rocket fuels. And then we, we found out that uh, above only 3% of, of all studies, uh, they, they basically have been allocated to pre-vaporized fuels above 10 atmospheres, right? So these are very small numbers. Then we move on to the turbulent flames. And then we found out that um, they are not only 2% of all published studies in turbulent combustion have been done at uh, uh, less than 2% at non-atmospheric pressure, whether it's below one atmosphere or above one atmosphere. And then if you take another slice and says, how many of the non-atmospheric pressures are experimental and include, include pre-vaporized liquid fuels is less than 0.2%. This is just an observation. All right, um, let's now focus on laminar flames and see uh, what we can do about extending the parameter space. Uh, this is a cartoon, shows basically um, where the knowledge is, uh, and you see in terms of carbon number and, and, uh, and, and pressures. The, basically, we are, uh, most of the studies are for very light fuels and for near atmospheric pressures, right? And as you approach the engine conditions, you start having minimum or non knowledge at all. <clears throat> um, this is a cartoon I've shown before. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I had here the pressure at the bottom and then the different techniques to, to study laminar flames. On the left, Niels is here. You do speciation of very low pressure flames so you can resolve the, the 50 millitor, <clears throat> for example, you can resolve the flame structure. Then up to 10, up between, let's say, a fraction of an atmosphere and 10 atmospheres, you can study different things, flame speeds, ignition, extinction limits, and chemical speciation. But then as you move to above 10 atmospheres, then your choices are very limited, and only the laminar flame speed is what is left. Um, just here I have, uh, again, uh, some comments on that. Uh, the Bunsen flame, it's actually 150 years Bunsen used the one on the left to to measure flame speeds, uh, counterflow flames, um, and then burn stabilized flames for basically speciation at low pressures or using the heat flux method, right? Now those, uh, especially with the counterflow flames, you can measure also extinction ignition limits. Um, and, and the problem with burner generated uh, uh, flames is that you cannot go to very high pressures. I mean, um, when you start going above uh, five to seven to 10 atmospheres, um, I mean, at Yale, they can go to much higher for non premix flames, but for premix flames, for example, there is no much you can do, basically, right? It's just instabilities uh, 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 kick in and, and, and then you, you start having transition to turbulence. So we try so many years to do this, it's not easy. So, so the results, so in any case, even if you go up to 10 atmospheres, I guess, um, it's not sufficient to get close to where engines are. Now, um, the, the spherically expanded flames uh, 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 is basically um, the, the, the only approach we have to study anything above 50 atmospheres. You see now the first video, um, video taken in my lab. This is a very nice spherical flame that goes out. We, but then um, if you fire in a different condition, then you can see a very different flame. Um, in this case, I guess, uh, uh, thermodiffusion instability is kicking first, and later, of course, hydrodynamic instability. It's a beautiful video, but again, you don't want to deal with one on the right, you want to deal with one on the left. Um, now, the laminar flame speed, um, I keep talking about that, and uh, uh, of course, one can say, you know, you, you do this for a long time, so you have it. Uh, you have uh, some high of, uh, of a preference to this property. Uh, yes and no. Um, so I wouldn't mind dropping it if, if, if I have seen that uh, uh, it doesn't help what we're trying to learn here. Uh, but in any case, let me give you a summary of my thought on this property, including ignition delay times. They're both key global properties of reacting meters. And we all know this is not the whole story. We all know we have to go to the details. We all know 
if we live in a planet in which we have all the diagnostics and we can measure every single radical, it's absolutely superb, superb knowledge compared to knowing just propagation speed or an ignition delay time, right? Because everything is lumped there, right? I get it, right? At the same time, when you get to application, you say, wait a minute, um, I, I, I had a model that predicts radicals in uh, some experiments. Then if you, but then you say, I want to predict my flame speed. Why? Because flame speed means heat release. The heat release is what drives the engine, right? So uh, you cannot really go away from this. Um, now, the, we know this, that we use the lambda flame speed for testing kinetic models and of course to scale Turbulent flame observables, of course, the flames have to be in the flame lit regime. Um, of course, one can, and has been questioned, right? Can question, uh, uh, why bother with lamina flame speed since uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it has modest sensitivity to chemistry, right? And this is from one of our papers. There are tons of plots like that. This is for a dodecane flame, the atmospheric conditions. And you see here that it's kind of boring, like the, the, the sensitivity is all on main, the main branching reaction, the CO oxidation, the, you know, what we know. And there are some other reactions, of course, that, that, that play a role. So you say those logarithmic sensitivity coefficients are not too large, right? With the exception, of course, the main branching, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 is not really a, 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 a large sensitivity coefficient, right? However, I'll pose the problem in a different way, right? Let's say, that the model fails to predict a lamina flame speed, automatically disqualifies from being used in a large scale simulation. You run, you don't run, you don't run a petascale, for example, Jackie Chen will be very reluctant to run a petascale simulation with a model that does not predict that the lamina flame speed, right? Because she will be criticized for not being able to predict uh, realistically the heat release. Um, another thing is that it does not matter how well we have measured our radicals, if your lamina flame speed is not predicted by the model and it happens, then we know that the model cannot predict the radical pool in a flame environment. Um, the other thing is the so-called modest sensitivity to chemistry is also important to consider because if you ask the question, okay, I have a model, it does not predict the lamina flame speed, and I want to, to improve it or adjust it or optimize it, whatever you want to call it, major modifications are required to achieve the agreement, all right? Because the, simply the sensitivity is, is modest. Um, so in summary, when we go to NG relevant conditions and we ask the question, what information we have from, from lamina flames, uh, my opinion is the only candidate that is left is the lamina flame speed. Now, moving on to spherically expanded flames, uh, moving towards our target. Um, this is a, 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 a DNS study, a DNS model we have done in my group. Um, there are two types of experiments. One is you have a, a, a constant volume chamber and you, do a, a, you consider the constant pressure region in which you have a flame expanding and of course under constant pressure conditions, right? And that's what we have on the left. Um, you ignite and then you go through a, a, through a semi-steady, quasi-steady uh, pressure regime and then of course you have the compression. And uh, this region here um, uh, is what um, has been proposed first by, by uh, the British Petroleum Researchers and then and Lo and Yiguanju, um, you know, uh, um, did some exceptional work using the double chamber and uh, being able to push this to, to very high pressures because safety is an issue in those experiments when you go to very, very high pressures. So um, the problem with this I will discuss is you cannot really deal with heavy liquid fuels. Okay, uh, what is measured in a constant pressure experiment? Uh, let's say this here, I took it from uh, one of uh, the thesis from Ed Law's group. Um, you measure the uh, radius uh, versus time, <clears throat> then you derive the burn flame speed versus uh, radius of the flame, then you produce burn flame speed versus stretch, then you plot burn flame speed versus stretch, and you do extrapolations to zero. Stretch, this is what you measure, this is what you process, and this is what you report, right? So you get the, lam the, um, you get the, uh, 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 the lamina flame speed SU or SU naught uh, by just 
considering the zero stress burn velocity times the density ratio, assuming, of course, uh, um, thermodynamic equilibrium uh, and no losses at the adiabatic, adiabatic conditions for the burn gases, right? Comments, advantages. The main advantage of this approach is that uh, you have optical access, so you can see the flame. Now, disadvantages, some of them are, will be the same with the next um, uh, approach that I will discuss. Um, uncertainty with equivalence ratio. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a low-tech concern, but it depends on how, how students and, and uh, researchers are dealing with pressure gauges in the laboratory and, and their uncertainty range. Uh, uh, you can really have issues when you fill up a tank where there is a shock tube or, or, or a, a constant volume chamber, the equivalence ratio can be uh, an issue, especially if you use low vapor pressure fuels. In any case, stabilities, this is a big deal. Um, of course, uh, um, we're smart enough now to suppress the thermal diffusion using helium, but the hydrodynamic, you have to deal with that. Um, you have to account, the, the motion of the flame is, is, is controlled by the thermal state of the burned gases and of course accounting from thermal radiation, the therm proper accounting for thermal radiation is important. Of course, Zen and Yiguan have been leading this and we learn from them. Uh, another thing that we learn from Zhang and, 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 and Yiguan and, and, and uh, Michael is basically uh, the compression effects that are there. They have published a very nice paper as they describe all those details. And of course, uh, 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 a paper from Zhang, Yiguan and Ed uh, um, presented in San Francisco, the first paper, um, really shows something very interesting uh, that the extrapolations are just using DNS. They show that you have to be very careful when you use theory uh, derived from simplified assumptions to extrapolate and they reported discrepancies between DNS results and theoretical results by as much as 70 percent. So uh, sometimes the, the, the theory agrees with DNS but under certain conditions that's not the case. So extrapolations are always tricky and we have to be mindful of that whether counterflow flames or spherically, uh, uh, spherically expanded flames. Um, the, the last issue, which is important, is that this experiment requires that uh, you have to wait for several minutes for the mixture to be quiescent. Therefore, you cannot afford doing that for heavy liquid fuels. Let's say you cannot sustain them at six, six or 700 Kelvin for 15 minutes because they will decompose, start decomposing around 600 Kelvin, right? So it, it sets a limit on what fuels you can, you can study uh, uh, so you have to keep them in the, in the gases in the gases phase at high pressures requires high temperature, but high temperature basically for a long time will cause the composition. In 1934, uh, Lewis and von Elbe um, said, "Okay, this is a nice experiment. This is exactly what I showed earlier. But in this DNS now, you see we allow the end gas, the unburned gas, to be compressed basically, right?" And this is what it is. Basically, you, you, you fire against the same plot I showed you before. And now uh, you go through the, 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 the constant pressure region and then you start having compression at the very end of this experiment. And then, um, if you, and then you use the pressure trace at the very end, especially when you have significant gradient of pressure with time. And, and then there is analysis that shows that the lamina flame speed can, is given by this formula over here um, now, um, th again, this is a very old idea. Um, so the only here, the only observable is the pressure. You, have, you need to have a spherical chamber. The problem here is that you need to model the, the RB. RB is the radius of the flame or the burned gases, right? So there is a modeling and you have to invoke a thermodynamic model to do so. The good news though is that uh, for this experiment, for example, if you, if you want to do uh, endodecane experiments of 50 atmospheres and 708 Kelvin, you just need to fire from eight atmospheres and 450 Kelvin, something that can be easily done in, in, in the laboratory. And the reason is that during the compression, you basically, uh, uh, the, the temperature of the unburned gas goes up and that allows you basically to maintain the, the, the uh, liquid hydrocarbon in the gaseous phase. Comments, advantages, uh, again, um, you, uh, you, can, you compress during, uh, during the compression, you can go up to 800 Kelvin or so. 
there is no need to heat the chamber at such temperatures. It's very dangerous, safety, and, and also you can lose the facility if something happens and has happened. Um, as I said, you can study heavy fuels because uh, you only expose them to 700 and 800 Kelvin from milliseconds. And if you do some, um, uh, some stands and kind of calculation, uh, 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 it's not stands, uh, yes, if you, yeah, if you basically uh, do um, the, you study the decomposition, uh, it's really minimum. Another thing that has been shown by uh, Jean and Ju and my group also subsequently is that during compression, and for all Lewis numbers, by the way, that would became an issue, the, during the compression stage, the Carl Lewis number is very small, 10 to minus three or so, right? So um, then if you compute, for example, you do DNS of this, and you can do DNS, and you go to the compression and, and, and compute your stretch rate, it's so small that you compute the lamina flame speed as the formula gives you, I showed you earlier, and then you compute it using a one dimensional, let's say the Sandia code, the premix code, the results are identical. So again, uh, in those experiments now, the way we do them is we have DNS codes. One is by Yiguan and we have also another one, Yiguan and Zhang, another one in my laboratory. So we do DNS and then we use the DNS as our experimental quote unquote data. And then we apply theory on the DNS results for which we know the answer, and then we test the validity of, of the theoretical assumptions, basically, right? Disadvantages, again, equivalence ratio, hydrodynamic instabilities. However, uh, this is a topic of research here that we're trying to look into that. Um, we all understand that as the pressure goes up, uh, flame thickness goes down, etc., and instabilities will kick in. However, this is not a constant pressure environment. This is a a variable pressure environment in which you have also some, some backflow coming from towards the center of, of, the, of, the, of the apparatus. And we have some circumstantial evidence suggesting that the development of instabilities during compression may not be as bad as in a constant pressure environment. But again, this is, this is something that we're exploring as we speak. Um, the other disadvantage is you cannot see the flame period. So you need to, I mean, there are some efforts in France right now, they develop a, a, um, develop a, a facility that they, they can see inside, but I'm not sure what is the resolution at the very end of the experiment when the compression happens. Again, I haven't heard from them yet. Um, so you have to introduce a thermodynamic model for data interpretation, right? Um, again, when you do this, you have to account for, for the radiation of the burn gases, very important. Uh, pro you have to account for product dissociation and you have to assess whether the assumption of equilibrium is, is valid. And those things can be done right now using uh, actually direct numerical simulations and apply uh, the theories or the test the assumptions. Some encouraging results, again, um, encouraging means we have data, we have published them. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say, they're encouraging. Uh, and I show you here different types of experiment uh, data. On the left is the good old methane here. We have uh, some data up to 30 atmospheres for methane and predictions for a number of models here, right? And uh, um, some models, what we learn here, for example, the USC MEC uh, seems to predict things very well up to 15 atmospheres. And then as you go to 30, the red line drops. Other than that, um, the, the, we, 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 we test our data against the uh, newer model, FFCM1, for example, and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and we see a consistency between um, model and, and data. Now, um, I don't know what to make of this. Um, we always produce data to develop and test models. At the same time, models, model predictions can give you feedback on data inconsistency, right? So I'm tentative here, but I believe we're moving in the right direction. Keep in mind that the flame speed goes up because the temperature goes up as the pressure goes up, right? Anyway, I call them encouraging results. Um, the other thing is on the right here is a collaboration with the Stanford group for, for jet and rocket fuels. These are the so-called A1, A2, A3 fuels, and RP1, RP2. 
and some modeling here done by high one with his high chem approach that's a real fuel so we cannot use anything else again the the trend of the data and the simulations are consistent um, and i will just call it encouraging but we took it further um, we here i have you some results for i present you some published results for gasoline fuels of course they are lighter than jet fuels right Again, uh, and this is a collaboration again with the Stanford group, and you see here the, the trends between data and simulations are, are, are satisfactory, I would guess, and there is no any attempt here to optimize any model. This is just the model the way it is and the data the way it is. On the bottom is something that we have not published. This is a diesel fuel. Uh, my students uh, gave me these results for diesel fuels, which are very heavy. And they told me, Professor, don't be so certain about us because we don't know if we lost fuel, it's a heavy one, et cetera, during injection. But then we compare with some end of decade predictions, which we know is going to be faster. And what we see here, we, we have a reasonable trend, okay? The trend is similar. And of course, the experimental data are lower than dodecane, which is expected. Um, again, this is evolution. I'm not saying these are the answers. All I'm saying, this is good to know, basically. That's all I can tell you. Um, some recommendations regarding this part is basically um, uh, my, my belief right now that if we want to get flame speeds, that's the only thing we can do at high pressures. We cannot resolve structures and we cannot do extinction, we cannot do flame ignition of those conditions. Um, we have to think along those terms, right? I mean, I'm not saying you should use exactly this technique, this technique is there, but something that resembles this approach is the way to go. Um, again, this is very important, of course, um, some people may disagree that combustion theory um, has been invaluable for us to learn all those things. But however, when you try to be quantitative, I advise against com using combustion theory to interpret experimental data that you report to the world is you better invoke DNS results to be able to understand what, you're, what is happening quantitatively and also to see, and also with DNS, uh, higher order DNS, you can also um, assess what happens with the stabilities. For example, if you do um, uh, multi-dimensional simulation, it says, okay, I have instability, so what? Do I build a lot of surface to, to affect me? Is the development of surface, uh, does the development of extra surface contribute to the, to the increase of burning rate that is within my uncertainty? Things like that, okay? Um, another, another, what I have noticed is that our, our field is very, um, uh, very limited when it comes to uh, variable pressure conditions, right? I mean, most of our understanding is that constant pressure conditions, when you go to variable, uh, uh, rapidly varying thermodynamic pressure, um, of course, you can say that this you can consider as quasi steady, but it depends. It depends how you study stretch, how you study. Uh, instabilities if you have a very deep, very steep DPDT term, right, in, in your equations. Um, uh, also here uh, is basically that uh, um, we need to think outside the box. The young people have to learn from that and go outside the box. Can we do something else? I personally right now, uh, there are some ideas, I'm involved with one of them, but again, uh, along those lines, can we do something else, right? We're still using what Lewis and Von Elbe said in 1934, right? Okay. Another personal comment is that, uh, I heard this comment is that, uh, why bother doing this and all that, uh, measuring this property? Um, I don't know, I, I have a different opinion. Uh, first of all, lambda flame speed is, is not something you can measure directly, period. So um, it's an elusive property and it's a great challenge. It requires enormous amount of infrastructure to measure this property at challenging conditions. I'm not discussing a methane air flame at one atmosphere. Anybody can do it within uncertainty. You, there's a, um, thousands of measurements in the literature, but can you measure a diesel fuel lamina flame speed at 70 atmospheres, okay? This is a challenge. And it, it's more than physics it's, it, in, in chemistry. It's also experimental issues, right? All right, turbulent flames. Um, um, Borgi diagram, I apologize for showing this. I understand that some people start smiling when they see that. Whatever it is, let's put it there to, just to have a conversation. 
Um, the way it was developed is very simple, right? And you cannot really ignore it. They use some very basic arguments in terms of time scales and length scales, right? And they use, they use as, as denominators the, those scales coming from freely propagating laminar flames. That's a good starting point, okay? Um, so, uh, so if you say that this has some validity here, right? Then, then of course the combustion community has tried to put points on this diagram to see where the practical devices are, right? And then they try and then they say, okay, is it uh, thin reaction zones, broken reaction zones, corrugated, whatever. And then they say, okay, those, the jet engines, for example, I know it's between thin reaction zones and broken reaction zones. And then, okay, let's develop an experiment in the laboratory that uh, resembles those conditions, right? Um, so, so when you do this, then based on this diagram, it's all, it's all basically has been developed around the, the, the concept of flamelets. And then um, current efforts point to that. Do we have flamelets? or well, we don't, right? Um, so, and then when, and the flameless, of course, the, 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 the properties of the flameless are always those of the freely propagating laminar flames, so steady one-dimensional laminar flames, which sometimes can cause some pain in terms of <coughs> um, what observables experimentalists are trying to, find, to, 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 to measure in, in experiments, but that's a different conversation. Um, so, as I said earlier, uh, moving between the thin and broken reaction zone, um, it appears to be relevant to air breathing propulsion devices. Those, uh, those of you who, who have seen a presentation of that topic, uh, that's where they are. And if you read the paper by Peters, uh, um, I mean, the argument and others, of course, say that, okay, um, when you get into this regime, um, small vortices, right, can enter the preheat zone potentially can reach the reaction zone and mess up the preheat zone and potentially affect the reaction zone, right? And then if you stick to the preheat zone, the argument is, okay, uh, if I have uh, um, turbulence entering my preheat zone, then I'm increasing my turbulent diffusivity and based on, uh, and then if, if the diffusivity goes up, whatever that means, based on analogy with the laminar diffusivity, then your thickness has to go up, right? That was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, hypothesis, right? Now, fast forward, um, in the recent years, uh, there's modeling efforts, one of them, of course, by Elaine and Alexi. And of course, uh, Jim is a pioneer in, in looking into that, right? Um, the results um, uh, indicate flame thickening, whatever that means. But then, um, if you read the latest paper by Driscoll, um, he doesn't seem to, to believe that uh, um, the turbulence have any chance within the flame, and 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 uh, um, the argument is basically that the, the the dissipation is so high for those little guys that they have no chance. So he he's looking into the large structures anyway. That's a different topic, right? So even without considering engine relevant conditions, we have a problem here. Is that when people discuss flame fitting, I have uh, I have put uh, forward. Um, some recommendations about that. I'm not sure when they say flame thickening what they mean and whatever they see in terms of thermal structure and formaldehyde structure, I'm not sure if they have a good way to understand why the formaldehyde or, or, the, or the thermal thickness increases so much as the turbulence goes up, right? Now, um, if we stick to still um, convenient conditions, right? And you say, I want to be, to do something about the Kolmogorov vortices that have been projected by, by Peters to be important. Then you say, okay, at one atmosphere, my, my flame is what, 100, 200, 300, 400 micrometers. And then how do you do this, right? You have to, to, to resolve it. You have to have a resolution in your measurements, 10 to 50 micrometers. Um, and I haven't seen this being there yet. Um, uh, if you raise the pressure, you, you, you cannot do anything, in my opinion, right? If you go to high pressures and uh, you have a steady state experiment, uh, not the, the spherically expanding flame, the unsteady flame, turbulent flame that Ed is doing, um, you cannot really study flame structures there. <coughs> if you have a steady experiment and run at tremendous flow rates, you cannot use helium to basically um, uh, um, uh, make your flame thicker, basically, right? 
So as you go to higher pressures, unfortunately for turbulent flames, um, you have to rely only on global properties, right? Which is no different than the laminar flames, right? So maybe the turbulent flame speed is the only thing left for you, right? If you say, I do flames at 10 atmospheres, 20 atmospheres, etc. cetera, um, maybe some global characteristics, flame lengths, lift off uh, heights and, and, uh, um, and measurements outside the flame potentially can be done. And then the connection is, that, and then the challenge is, if you want to have an opinion of what happens with, with uh, um, uh, an opinion with what happens uh, uh, in terms of flame structure as you go to high pressures, if you only observe as a global flame property, how do you connect this global flame property to the uh, some hypothetical flame structure, basically? Um, <clears throat> okay. But there's more complications, right? Um, if you, if you uh, try to scale experimental results of data different pressures, how do you do this, right? So when I did my thesis with Ed Lowe, he taught me that, well, um, when you change pressure, um, lamina flames, much easier topic, uh, make sure you compare the burning rate, not the flame speed, actually, because that's how you learn what happens with chemistry. Very good point, and I keep using it. Here, we have to basically, if you say I want to do two experiments at two pressures, and I want to be at the same point with this diagram, right? That's an academic question, right? How do you do this, right? You have to match length scales, velocity scales, Karlovitz number, dump uh, color number, right? And also you have to consider fluid density. Uh, as I said here, uh, from extrapolations that I make from laminar flames, speeds are kinematic, it's a kinematic effect, right? But mass burning rates, relates directly to chemistry. Nature understands mass, nature does not understand speeds. <clears throat> Speed is something we basically manufacture because we can use diagnostics to measure it. Now, um, I don't want to bother you, but I have done a simple analysis. Let's say I have a burner. <clears throat> I know Isaac is working on this too. Um, uh, I have a burner. I, I cannot have many, many different burners, right? Let's say one burner of small diameter, sometimes you cannot reduce the diameter, let's say below five millimeters, that's what I'm talking about, right? For turbulent flames, because then the diagnostics are not sufficient to resolve one millimeter burner. Um, and then I want to be at the same point on the Borghi diagram, right? Assuming the Borghi diagram has some value, right? Then you can show, based on what we know from integral scales from Kobayashi and others, and, and, the, and the RMS velocity, anyway, uh, offline I can, I can show you my derivation then, if you want to be at the same point, you need to match both burning rate and mass flow rate. So if you do this, then the laminar flame speed has to scale like one over P. But also the laminar flame speed varies like P to the N over two minus one, which N is the overall reaction order, right? So if you want to match those things, you need to modify the, the equivalence ratio. <laughs> and if you modify the equivalence ratio, then the damn color number changes, right? Do I have an answer to that? No, I don't. But this is, a, this is something of interest. In terms of pressure effects, uh, it's the, the literature is pretty weak. Uh, Kobayashi have shown this formula here for uh, turbulent flame speeds up to 10 atmospheres, right? For methane flames. Um, again, uh, the whole idea here is that as you increase the pressure, <clears throat> your burning rate goes up. And therefore, uh, why the burning goes up? Because the hydrodynamic stability is kicking. You have more instabilities, more flame surface. Etc. And so everything is based on instability and 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 surface generation. That that's a very nice contribution. <clears throat> as, as, at the same time, one thing that more, many of these studies are doing is that the turbulence intensity is characterized at the reference point, usually at the burner exit, is not local. <clears throat> so there is no anything here to that we can use to address chemical effects other than the chemical effects included in the laminar flame speed itself. They'd be more into that. Um, another thing is that when you do turbulent flames um, using methane, there is a major difference between doing methane and doing a heavy molecule. The thing is that methane, it's well known that it's very stable. It does not decompose. So you have turbulent mixing and the unburn, and you have hot gases coming uh, into the unburn side of the flame then the methane and the, and the heavy hydrocarbon 
will behave very differently because the heavy hydrocarbon can be seriously uh, modified through the composition. Therefore, whatever you think about your equivalence ratio, etc., may not be meaningful. So um, here I will end with a couple slides uh, from, my, from my own group here. We have trying to scratch the surface on those, some of those topics, right? Using a modified Sydney burner. Uh, the first attempt is atmospheric flames. These are um, different fuels. It's just a fuel effect, right? Uh, we match the Reynolds number, the turbulence Reynolds number, the flame speed. And we resolve here C8 uh, chemiluminescence. Yes, it's a line of sight measurement. And, but then we have shown that lack of C8 star means local extinction. And you can see here how distributed the combustion is for methane and how disrupted it is for the heavier molecules, especially toluene. At the bottom, you see, so these are basically instantaneous images. At the bottom, you see that the average, the average flames, flame shapes are, are kind of similar. So if we go ahead and, and do some two-point spatial correlations and, and estimate um, somehow in the uh, uh, reacting pockets length scales, you see tolerance are very large, methane is very small, and the, this is attributed to the, how distributed is the combustion and how disrupted is the combustion, right? So we see here a significant, a significant um, fuel effect uh, by matching the lambda flame speed at one atmosphere. Uh, we just started doing some high, pre high elevated pressure experiments, I wouldn't call it high. Uh, again, uh, this is our chamber here. Uh, we put here a modified version of the Sydney burner inside this chamber. On top, I have uh, here I show you some results for uh, ethylene flames. And, and you see for that on the left, uh, the flame is, has local extinction at the tip. Then at the middle, the flame starts igniting at the tip, and on the right, the flame is burning vigorously. There is no extinction. This is what also Bilger did, uh, 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 Mastery and Dan, in, in their papers. Uh, more or less, they, they have different regimes. I'm not doing this here, but again, there is, uh, when the, the burning is, the equivalent ratio is weak, then you start having uh, uh, tip extinction, and then the tip ignites, and then you have vigorous burning. And on the right, I have um, um, just, how the, the, the flame height varies with SL. And then you see that whether you use, you, you uh, um, uh, again, you have extinction uh, on, on the left of the peak here. On the left of the peak, you have tip extinction. On the right, you have vigorous burning. And you see here the scaling, how different it is if you scale these results either with flame speed or with the burning rate, right? So um, in any case, uh, I, don't, I don't have time to go further into that. And I, I have some closing uh, recommendations and thoughts for that part of my talk. Um, my opinion is we, uh, we need to expand our, our um, turbulent flame studies beyond one atmosphere and beyond uh, uh, methane or light gaseous fuels. Um, uh, in my opinion, again, and of course, Ed has shown some of his results based on physics of Lewis number. When you change pressure and fuel, um, the phenomena are very rich, right? And uh, um, within the flame could be uh, uh, if turbulence has a chance. I'm not sure about that. Or in the far field outside the flame, right? So pre-flame composition can be uh, modified significantly. Um, so if you assume turbulence enters the preheat zone and you mess up your thermal state within the preheat zone, a heavy fuel will react very differently than methane. Um, local extinction reignition are, are critically depending on chemistry and Lewis number. Um, and, and the, and the so-called flame thickening behavior may be modified significantly, right? And we have to understand how to scale things as we change fuels and we change particularly pressure in the Borghi diagram, right? And finally, a connection between global observables and local flame structure needs to be made. And I will close here by, by telling everybody that this is not, these are not my ideas. These are, some of them are what I believe and also I learn a lot from our colleagues here, Ken, Jan, Jim, Ron, Iguan, Katerina, Ed, Adam, and last but not least, hi. Uh, their work has really inspired our work and we learn a lot and uh, um, I don't have answers to many of those questions and uh, I think this is work in progress and I'll stop here and thank you so much and I will be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for for the very nice and exciting talk. So now we are open the floor for questions. 
I have received several questions from the audience, so I'm going to ask on behalf of them. The first two questions are from Yi Guangzhou. The first one is, uh, frame ball is a major finding in the combustion research. It is well uh, defined the reaction fusion frame structure subject to radiation at limited conditions. So the question is, how can we make a good use of frame ball of, for fuel chemistry validation? Flame ball. Well, um, flame ball is a different regime. I didn't, I didn't cover it here. Um, maybe there is something there that I'm missing, but uh, um, uh, I think that the convection is not a, uh, uh, it's a totally different physics from what I discussed. So um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't done those experiments and I'm not sure um, uh, what are the issues. Maybe Paul, uh, Paul is here, I guess. He can, he can add to this. But uh, um, I, I'm not sure how this, uh, first of all, the flame balls are for ultra lean hydrogen airflames, right? Correct? Um, uh, no, not, necess not necessarily. They, they can, it's, a, it's an exact solution to the governing equations for any combustible mixture. However, you, in most cases, it's unstable. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the way you did it is basically for ultra, ultra lean hydrogen airflames, right? Right, but that's not the only case where they can exist. In yes. fact, we've had that we've found them in methane air mixture. But anyway, this is your talk. I'll, we can discuss that offline. Right, right. So uh, to be honest, I, I don't have experience with this. Uh, clearly, uh, there would be conditions. Uh, the, uh, now, the conditions of the flame ball. The question is, the condition that the flame ball reaches, can they be uh, the kinetic the kinetic uh, effects? Uh, first of all, I'm not sure if if, if those uh, flame balls can can exist at 50 or 80 atmospheres, basically, right? That's oh, sure they can. In principle, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's a possibility, okay. Then, but I, I cannot express an expert, uh, I cannot uh, give you an expert opinion on this because um, uh, I have not done the experiments. The experiments I have done um, are in totally different regime. Uh, that's all I can tell you right now. The second question is, uh, uh, Professor Ron Hansen at Stanford is developing frame speed measurement using shock tube at high temperature and high pressure. Correct. To your understanding, what are the constraints in his experiments for frame speed measurement at elevated temperature and pressures? Um, my, I have not done, of course, uh, his experiment. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm peripherally, uh, 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 they're very promising. Um, the only thing I can tell you from what I see is that there are major advances made there. However, there are also some major issues. They try and they see double flames and other phenomena, which um, I think Yiguang is helping them and you helping them, Zen, I believe. Um, um, they, there are phenomena there that are not very clear, okay? So um, it, it is not, uh, 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 more needs to be done uh, maybe this is the way to go. Maybe this is the way to go, but I don't think all the, the kings have been ironed out yet. And, and there are lots of still ongoing papers, uh, reviews, um, uh, and there are some concerns by the community, right? So, but I'm not, cannot elaborate on everything, right? But clearly what uh, Ron has suggested is promising. Uh, and that's what I just said, right? We have to think outside the box, right? And uh, the argument is, can you do the same thing with uh, RCM, basically, right? You, you, you compress the RCM and then you basically ignite, right? These are all ideas that we need to understand, basically, right? But all I'm saying is that uh, the problems we have tackling a well-established technique, like the ones, for example, Zhen, you and Yiguan and, and Ed have been studying for a long time now, uh, there are enormous problems there, right? And uh, Modeling those conditions uh, is important. Now, if you, if you think about the shock tube experiments, and if you think about the advantage it has when you have a, a flame propagating into a reacting mixture, right? Uh, this is a very difficult proposition. The problem is that although you learn something, how do you model, if you want to model this, you have to model both the high temperature and the low temperature kinetics, right? How, if I have a dodecane flame, and I know my, uh, in the shock tube that the spherical flame, let's say it's totally spherical, everything is nice, it propagates into the uh, already reacting mixture that is dodecane, what is my uncertainty in addressing NTC chemistry or endodecane, okay? So um, we're not there yet, so I'm not sure. 
So if you say that I can go to very high pressures and very high temperatures um, with uh, uh, non-reacting and gas, then it's fine, right? On the other hand, you have to think about running a shock tube and running uh, our vessels, uh, it's day and night in terms of infrastructure and in terms of, of, of cost, basically, right? So again, um, more needs to be done with the shock tube, in my opinion. Next question is from Santosh. Uh, his question is about uh, extinction strain rate. How difficult is it to measure the, uh, measure the extinction strain rate at high pressures? And uh, should it be used to uh, addition, as an additional parameter for kinetic model validation? Absolutely. Absolutely. We would love to do this. I don't know how to do this. The problem is that to, me to, ex to measure extinction strain rate um, in a steady burner, you have to use the counterflow flames, right? Um, uh, of course, you can, you can do some, analyze some turbulent flame experiments and say locally, uh, if you have the diagnostics and you can find the, the strain rate and the curvature, but it's not very clean, right? So you, I cannot imagine that anybody can build uh, um, for premix flames, for premix flames, uh, a burner that can operate at 50 or 60 atmospheres and has laminar flames impinging on each other, right? And get the extinction strain rate. Uh, in my laboratory, the highest we have gone is about seven to eight atmospheres, right? Even the data at seven to eight, uh, for premix flames. For non-premix flames, we went up to 10 atmospheres. But even this data, I haven't published them, I'm not very sure. There are major, major, major issues in terms of the stabilities, right? And again, as I said, you cannot reduce if you want to reduce your Reynolds number, you cannot go to, to one millimeter nozzle, right? You need resolution, right? So below five millimeters nozzles or four millimeter nozzles, it's, it's very hard to resolve anything in the burner. So I don't think we can do it. The next question is from Joe. Uh, his question is, uh, you have discussed the methods for measurement of laminar flame speed in detail, but could you comment a bit more on best methods for measurement of turbulent flame speed, particularly at high pressures? Well, the, the turbulent flame speeds, uh, again, um, I don't declare expertise there, but my understanding is you have to quantify that to basically identify the flame surface, right? So many have done, uh, Jim Driscoll and Omer Gulder are doing this and others, Kobayashi is doing this, right? So I, I don't think, if you identify your OH surface, um, I guess um, if you don't aim to resolve it, but you find basically the maximum the location of the maximum OH, if you can measure OH, of course, uh, at high temperatures with accuracy because of uh, broadening and other things, or you can use uh, miscattering. Um, uh, again, when you go to turbulent flames, it, it, it's not any more exact science. The bar is not as high as you measure laminar flame speeds, right? So um, if your diagnostics can survive at 50 atmospheres or 40 atmospheres, you can do it. Another point is, Joe, that I don't believe that anybody right now can go above five to 10 atmospheres in turbulent, in, in continuous turbulent flame speeds. Now, having uh, turbulent flame speeds for a steady experiment. Now, let me go back one step. Ed Lowe has done the spherically expanding flames, right? So that may, that may be uh, another, another way to do this, right? But I'm not sure to what pressures, maybe up to 10 atmospheres again, right? Um, uh, this we, is we have gone to 10 to 20, I think. 10 oh, you have to 20, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, turbulent, turbulent. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm commenting mostly on, on the steady burners, right? But again, the, no. the, 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 the those no, spherical, the spherical, spherical. Yeah, the spherical, yeah. That's another way to go. Uh, next question is from Pong. Uh, his question is, can you comment on the extension of the existing flame experiment to the investigation of cool flame and the auto-ignition assistant flames under engine relevant conditions? These flames not only serve as the unique kinetic targets combustion phenomena, but also play crucial critical roles in the transient process in spray and engine con combustion. If we go to, uh, if we talk about uh, laminar flames, um, if you want to study uh, uh, cool flames, you have to go to, to, to high pressures. Um, uh, some, again, this is not something that I have tried in my laboratory. So uh, I try to express opinions about things that I have, uh, I have uh, direct experience. Um, in terms of cool flames, uh, I'm not sure uh, if, if I try to do it at very high pressures. First of all, 
I cannot use a steady burner, right? A steady burner will not be able to do this because of turbulence, right? So I have to rely on, 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 uh, on spherically expanding flames. So spherically expanding flames that I need the high temperature to be there, right? Of course, I can design conditions in which before my flame, I will have activity, right? I can, I can have uh, cool flames ahead of my flame, right? So again, the same arguments, the same arguments hold that um, you can do these experiments. If you can go to those pressures without instabilities, you can do those experiments without having any chemical activity in the unburned gas, but also you can design your experiment to have chemical activity in the unburned gas, which of course will affect the overall flame propagation phenomena, right? Now, the chemical activity on the unburned gas, if it starts brewing uh, and have low temperature chemistry, I don't think it will affect the stability of the problem, right? So all I'm discussing here is issues of stability, right? If my flames are not stable, then my assumptions go out of the window. So yes, it can be done as long as the high temperature flames as they move are stable. The next is uh, maybe a comment from Jiko. Uh, Forest fires and other accident fires are still not controlled and understood, and will always keep combustion relevant at a field, as a field. Absolutely, I mean it's a very complex phenomenon. The problem with fires, it's very hard to do very fundamental. Of course, there is a lot of effort on the fundamentals, but somehow the the fire community is is between fundamentals and applied, basically, right? So. It, it, it's very difficult to, 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 from what I see here, to do anything below correlations, right? So, but I agree that, uh, as I said in my presentation, that wildfires would be a topic of concern for, for many, many, forever, basically, right? Based on what we see, I fully agree. But I don't know how our community can be involved. The mainstream combustion community, combustion institute community, can be more involved in, in, in fire research. It's not, right, as we speak. The question is from uh, Shan Long Zhu. His question is that uh, he, he said that he, uh, we should study combustion at a high pressure and uh, have, for heavy fuels. However, no matter how gaseous fuel or liquid fuel I researched in the past, I found that it's very hard to get a convincing detailed or reduced chemical kinetic models under such conditions. How do you think about this? I couldn't agree more. The problem is we don't have the data, right? <laughs> so to, to have a kinetic model, you have to have data. All I show you here, you look at the literature, there is absolutely uh, a black hole when we go to those conditions, right? We don't have the data. And I'm not alone. The engine industry, you know, because they come to me because of flame speed and others, we don't have the data. If we don't have the data, we cannot start a conversation, right? Now, if we have the data, then we say, okay, having this data, the first thing you do is you test a model at conditions that are not there. You say, okay, let me, let me test. Let's say we have some good data, 70, 80 atmospheres and say, okay, let's, let's see what happens, right? Let's see if those models we have at 10, 20 atmosphere work. Now, if they disagree, then we learn something. If they agree, um, again, we have to be tentative, right? So that's not an easy thing to do. Actually, development of kinetic models is an issue under any conditions, right? Now, what I have to add is that high pressures uh, that introduce all kinds of problems for us to go there, um, it, we don't have the data. So it's irrelevant to discuss how difficult it is to develop a model. Plus there are other issues, as I said, right? Conservation equations, if you go to very high pressures, can we go to 100 atmospheres? Can we go to 150 atmospheres, right? Uh, do the conservation equations hold, right? Um, assumptions, ideal gas, all kinds of things, right? We're not done, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's an incredibly, uh, 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 it's a virgin territory for us to, to look into that. Not easy though. I think the four king, I really appreciate that uh, your a wonderful talk and I, we all really like beautiful flames. And uh, you made a wonderful review of the past uh, and then future. You really extend that the, uh, the frontier of nominal flame to real fuels at high temperature and high pressure. Uh, I look forward to that, uh, to the uh, to the future of your study. Thank you very much.